No, no, I just ask you to admit all, admit all the participants. Shilpa? Sir, tell me, sir. No, no, yeah, you yeah, yeah, admit all the participants and uh, one more minute is there to play the start the video. Yeah, yeah, all are, all are in, sir. All are in, yeah, just wait, wait for a minute that uh, the exact 10 o'clock will start with the video. We yeah. have only 12 participants. Have you admitted all? Yeah, yeah all are auto-admitted. Uh, uh, no, no, we will have a lot. I... We will have a lot in the YouTube, madam. That is a thing. Okay. Like, uh, I guess a lot of PGs join in YouTube. So, nine ten, sir. Yeah, you can start with. Me. Yeah, you can start with the startup video. Shilpa, yeah. <laughs> Uh, good morning, uh, one and all. We welcome you all for this online anesthesia uh, program. This is an anesthesia update program. We are successfully conducting it for past two years. Uh, first year was to, towards the postgraduate teaching program, and now it is an anesthesia update for uh, freelancers. And uh, this program is headed by Professor Dr. Edward Johnson, sir. So me, uh, Dr. Rajesh from Meenakshi Mission Hospital, Madurai, I am I'm going to conduct the session today. And this session will be coordinated by Dr. Gomati uh, from uh, Rajiv Gandhi uh, General Hospital, Chennai. And she is an associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine. And Madam has such a passionate work towards uh, cadaveric transplants and the organ donation program. And she is a volunteer there and she is doing a phenomenal work there. And we welcome you, madam, for this uh, program to coordinate. And today's uh, session, today's session has a theme that how I do it. And it's related to onco surgeries. See, we had a World Anesthesia Day celebration recently. And the motto of that uh, World Anesthesia Day celebration was to create awareness towards anesthesia for onco surgery. So we selected the topic related to that. So we have two eminent speakers today. Uh, to share their vision towards that, how I do it, related to uh, anesthesia for breast surgery and anesthesia for upper airway uh, malignancies. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Hetel Vedera from uh, Rajput and Dr. Preeta Raj from Chennai. We welcome both of you for, uh, and also thank you for spending your uh, uh, valuable time with us in this uh, auspicious Sunday. And uh, on this outset, I like to uh, thank our uh, sponsors, Akrula, and the host that is A1 Logistics and media partner Anesthesia TV, because with, without them, it cannot be such a successful program for running for past two years. With, I thank uh, all of them. And uh, over to you, Gumuthi Madam, to conduct this. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, a very bright Sunday and morning to all of you. Our uh, first speaker of the day is Professor Dr. Uh, Hethul Badera, and he is the head of the department, Department of Anesthesiology, Sterling Hospital, and he is speaking to us all the way from Rajgarh on a Sunday morning. And his topic will be anesthesia for breast surgery and how he does it. So, are we ready, sir? Shall we? Shall we start? But one more to add, Sir is already conducting, um, he is having a separate YouTube channel and uh, he is uh, so much dedicated to uh, teaching the postgraduates and the freelancers and he is having a lot of, uh, he has done a lot of works in through the YouTube and a lot of videos are available uh, from him for us to get updated in every angle and today he will be talking on uh, the breast surgery anesthesia. That's excellent. So I, I hope at the end of his presentation, he will share his links for the benefit of all our postgraduates who are watching us today. Will that be possible, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, yes madam. Sir. Definitely, we will do it. Thank you so much, sir. Over to you, sir. So, my screen is visible, right? Yes, it is. Yes, sir. Uh, so, thank you, Bumping, madam, for kind introduction. Uh, I would like to 
thank uh, anastasia updates uh, dr edwards sir dr rajesh sir for inviting me for this talk so as madam said i am going to talk about anesthesia for breast surgery how i do it but before i go to how i do it uh, i believe i should say why i do it rather than telling how i do it so in the uh, next 40 or 45 minutes uh, we will talk uh, on on the following topics like uh, breast cancer statistic various type of breast surgery anatomy of the breast how we do pre op assessment intra operative management regional anesthesia for breast surgery post op management breast surgery and chronic pain and type of anesthesia and cancer recurrence so if we talk about statistic first in 2020 there were 2.3 million women diagnosed with breast cancer and 6.85 lakhs amongst them died died globally so as of the end of 2020 there were 7.8 million women alive who were diagnosed with breast cancer and it is a huge number making it world's most prevalent cancer and if we look at the indian data in india in 2018 incidence of breast cancer was roughly 1.62 lakh and it is roughly 28% of all newly detected cancer in women so it is a more most common cancer diagnosed among female in india also and it, if you look at the mortality also it is roughly 24% in our country so it, it it is a cause of very high mortality and it is with a high incidence also <clears throat> so if we look at the breast surgery it starts with a uh, axillary lymph node dissection then we are moving to sentinel lymph node biopsy earlier it was mrm now we are doing bcs simple mastectomy only for uh, palliative care and now we are going for reconstructive surgery as well as for cosmetic surgery also so every surgery comes with their, their own challenges so like if we do axillary lymph node dissection in a patient the patient has chances of lymphedema in the post operative period which will lead to uh, swelling in the limb, uh, upper limb and which can be the cause of concern in the patient upper limb sensory loss is commonly seen after axillary lymph node dissection and patient have prolonged stain prolonged um, uh, drain drains for the drainage of the lymph after the surgery so it is it, it, it has got higher morbidity so now people are moving from ex- axillary lymph node dissection to sentinel lymph node biopsy so they initially do sentinel lymph node biopsy and then they uh, go for the axillary lymph node dissection if required so in sentinel lymph node biopsy basically the sentinel lymph node is the first node of the group of lymph nodes that drains from the primary cancer so it is the first node or the group of lymph nodes that drains from the primary cancer and that that that's why it is more likely to get metastatic disease so if we do sentinel lymph node mapping that is usually carried out with a combination of radio isotopes and a dye injected near the tumor during the surgery for removal of primary cancer so we inject radio isotopes and various dyes uh, close to the uh, primary tumor which spreads to the sentinel lymph node and if uh, lymph nodes are affected then we then we can go for a complete axillary lymph node di- uh, dissection otherwise we can uh, do staging with sentinel lymph node biopsy and uh, avoid the morbidity with axillary lymph node dissection the lymph node with the highest radioactive signal will be removed and sent for the study uh, but it is it has also some challenges challenges like isosulfan blue and patent blue we are two most common used dyes and these dyes are associated with immunoglobulin in e mediated anaphylactic reaction and incidence is as high as 1% but it is for mild reactions and serious reaction can occur in 0.17% of the patients so when surgeon is doing sentinel lymph node biopsy and using this dyes you have to be careful if you find any hemodynamic changes you should think of anaphylactic reaction and treat accordingly methylene blue can be used but again it causes the bluish discoloration of the body fluids and it comes in the monitoring of of pulse oximetry also uh, so surgeries are now nowadays we are moving to uh, breast conservative surgery from simple mast- uh, simple mastectomy or mrm so when 
typically do breast conservative surgery incisions are smaller dissection is uh, less so post operative period in the post operative period patients are more comfortable but according to incision and dissection we have to choose the block to provide regional anesthesia again duration of the surgery is a little bit prolonged as compared to modified radical mastectomy so in this this cases we have to be uh, careful about hypothermia hypovolemia and all those things so accordingly we have to monitor the patient and uh, treat if uh, any changes are first reconstruction surgeries these are the long surgeries it can be myocutaneous flap or free flap when they use myocutaneous flap usually they use uh, uh, rectus abdominis flap or latissimus dorsi flap so area of dissection is larger you require uh, better analgesia for this you, you you might require catheters to treat the abdominal pain or latissimus dorsi pain uh, and duration of surgery is quite longer as compared to simple mrm same way if you are using pre prep you have to be careful about hypothermia hypovolemia otherwise perfusion of the free uh, flap will be hampered and uh, there are chances that, that uh, flap failure will happen so you have to take care of all those things when these surgeries are done you have to think of uh, thr- uh, thromboprophylaxis also in these cases because these are prolonged surgery and there are chances of thromboembolism so when you are doing uh, performing uh, such surgeries you you should provide the pneumatic compression device as well as you should go for uh, lmws in the post operative period postmortem surgeries are uh, like mammoplasty and prosthetic implant mammoplasty is similar to um, a simple mastectomy but when you are using prosthetic Im- they are using prosthetic implants they sometimes they go for staging surgery initially they put the implant below the pec major slowly they expand the implant and then in second stage uh, they put the main implant so here uh, nose uh, chances of uh, damage of the nose like uh, 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 pectoral nose and uh, long thoracic nose are there so there are chances of a uh, chronic post operative pain so we should treat the pain accordingly so that we can reduce the chances of chronic pain when we go for pre operative assessment obviously these patients are very anxious we need to talk to this patient we should give some time to resolve their queries they have anxiety about uh, anesthesia they have anxiety about post operative pain they have anxiety about uh, um, uh, how surgery will be done so we should talk give some time so that we can reduce the anxiety and if required we should go for medication which can help in the uh, reducing the anxiety uh, in some of the patient chemotherapy started pre operatively when they are inoperable they want to convert it to operable cases uh, in such cases they start chemotherapy and so, certain chemotherapy agent uh, are cardiotoxic they can cause cardiomyopathy so in such cases we should go for ecg as well as echo uh, irrespective of age of the patient Uh, and is irrespective of the complaint of the patient so when chemotherapy started you should go for uh, eco in all patient neoadjuvant hormonal therapy again it is used to reduce the size of the tumor uh, so, uh, so that locally advanced tumor are make uh, make initially inoperable cancer more amenable to resection it can uh, but it can cause myelosuppression which may manifest as perioperative anemia increase risk of bleeding, bleeding tendency and neutropenia um, neutropenia can increase the chance of post operative infection so when patient is on new adjuvant therapy we should keep these things in mind tamoxifen and uh, aromatase inhibitor can also uh, be cardiotoxic uh, cardiotoxic and may increase the risk of perioperative venous thromboembolism so in such cases it, uh, we should go for uh, thromboprophylaxis and we should uh, look for eco also anesthesia management uh, there are differences between tiva versus inhalation opioid versus opioid free anesthesia and we'll talk about regional anesthesia also so when we talk about uh, tiva versus uh, uh, inhalation agent uh, in, inhalation anesthesia this is a very good study where they compared outcome after breast surgery between inhalation uh, and propofol based intra uh, in intravenous anesthesia and it was a meta analysis and what they found was propofol based intravenous anesthesia was associated with most post operative rescue analgesia but incidence of, of post operative nausea and vomiting was lower in uh, propofol based anesthesia again propofol based anesthesia uh, preserved the nature of killer cell cytotoxicity and decreased the il6 level 
uh, and neutrophil to lympho lymphocyte ratio, which may help to reduce the chances of uh, recurrence. So they have got increased two year recurrence free survival, uh, especially propopol based anesthesia. But still, evidence is not enough to stem that uh, propopol based anesthesia is uh, better as compared to inhalation anesthesia. Still, studies are going on. Same way with opioids versus opioid free anesthesia. Opioids again suppress the immunity. We'll see in the further slide also. Uh, and uh, when we use opioid free anesthesia uh, uh, with other drugs, uh, there are less chances of recurrence. But again, it is not proven. We will discuss about regional anesthesia technique in detail. Regional anesthesia, again, it reduces the chances of recurrence. It was uh, postulated after some uh, uh, retrospect retrospective study, but uh, when, they, uh, when they go for a, a prospective study, the, a correlation was not uh, found. Uh, so when we do um, uh, anesthesia in such patient, in, in, intraoperatively important is IV line. It should be taken on the opposite limb because this limb will be faint and trap. And uh, uh, postoperatively, uh, it re, uh, initially it was believed that it reduces the chances of lymphadenoma. Airway secure again. It is between eye gel versus uh, intubation. If surgery is short duration and so your surgeon is faster, then you can uh, get away with eye uh, gel. But uh, if if it is like uh, LD flap or when, uh, in during surgery, if we require to change the position, it is better to secure the airway during the surgery because uh, your airway will be under draps. So if uh, if your eye gel get uh, uh, disturbed, then it, it is uh, difficult to secure it again during the surgery. Position of the patient, again, it is mostly supine with abducted arm. So you should be careful about uh, giving position because, so that uh, there is no traction on the black brachial plexus. Uh, in LD prep, they give lateral position. So while giving position, you should be careful so that your uh, airway doesn't get uh, uh, disturbed. Uh, combination of RA and GA is preferred uh, nowadays because it provides post-optive analysis also and during surgery requirement of general anesthesia drugs can be uh, brought down and which helps in the faster recovery, less nausea vomiting and post-operative pain period. Uh, hypothermia, hypovolemia, as I said, it is common in the prolonged surgery like flap surgeries. So you should be, you should take care of all these things uh, for the better flap survival. Blood loss, uh, it is not very common nowadays for uh, MRM surgery or breast conservative surgeries, but it can happen with uh, pre-flap surgeries or um, myocutinous flap surgery. So uh, in such cases, we have to be ready with uh, some uh, blood transfusion. DVT prophylaxis, as I said, it should be uh, done in the patient uh, uh, wherever possible. If, suppose surgery is shorter, then we can go for pneumatic compression devices. And if it is longer, then we should go for LMWH. Regional anesthesia. This is a very important topic. So we will discuss it in detail. So uh, in regional anesthesia, initially we need to learn the anatomy. So if you look, look at the anatomy of the breast and the nerve supply of the breast, Breast is supplied by the lateral cutaneous branches of the intercostal nerve. So this is the anterior branch of lateral cutaneous nerve, which supplied the lateral part of the breast. This is anterior cutaneous branch of the intercostal nerve, and this is the lateral part of it, and it supplies the medial part of the breast. If you go down, here you can see this area is supplied by the supraclavicular nerves, and it is part of superficial cervical plexus. Again, this, as I said, this is medial branches, and these are the lateral branches. So breast is supplied by supraclavicular nerve, that is super, superficial cervical plexus. These are the thoracic nerve. And if we look at the nerve supply of the muscles of the breast, um, pectoral muscles are supplied by the lateral and medial pectoral nerve, uh, serratus anterior by long thoracic nerve, and um, uh, latissimus dorsi by, by the thoracodorsal nerve. So they are branches of brachial plexus. So you have to block these branches for complete analgesia because uh, dissection in this area can lead to, uh, they are motor branches, but uh, they are they can cause some pain if there is stretching of, of the muscles. So you have to take care of all these branches. So basically, 
um, breast is supplied by brachial plexus, cervical plexus, as well as the thoracic nerve. So it has got complex nerve supply. So when you want to provide regional anesthesia for breast surgery, you should keep all these things in the body mind. So if you look at this video, here you can see this is pec major muscle. If I remove it, you can find pec minor muscle. And above the pec minor, you will see this is lateral pectoral now and this is medial pectoral now. So when you deposit the drug between these two muscles, it becomes your pec swell block and it will block lateral as well as medial pectoral now. If you go laterally, you find this is serratus anterior muscle. This is long thoracic now, and below that you find the lateral cutaneous branches. So if you deposit the drug between pex, uh, pec minor and serratus, it, it will become your pex 2 block and it will block T2 to T6 lateral cutaneous branches and long thoracic now. For sep block, you go further posteriorly in the mid to posterior axial line and this you can see this is the thoracodorsal now. So if I remove the uh, muscle that is latissimus torsi, you will find that uh, below that is the serratus anterior muscle. So if you deposit the drug between these two muscles, it will block thoracodorsal now as well as the lateral cutaneous branches that is T2 to T9. So according to the surgery, you have to select the block. So there are various options, like we can give thoracic epidural, we can give paravertebral block, we can give erector spiny block, we can give intercostal block, we can give sep block, PEX1, PEX2, transverse thoracic plane block, and there are many other blocks which are invented in last few years, uh, they are used for breast surgeries. Uh, so, if you look at the thoracic epidural, it is a, a age-old technique, it is a gold standard technique, it provides bilateral analgesia, uh, you require less amount of uh, 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 local anesthetic drug, but I believe it is too invasive for breast surgery. We don't uh, need to go for epidural for breast surgery. There are many blocks which can provide regional anesthesia, and it is contraindicated in patients on antiplatelet and anticoagulant drugs. Uh, and it is, of course, associated with hemodynamic changes uh, where, uh, with, while with other blocks, you can prevent it. So now we will move to thoracic paravertebral block. Thoracic uh, paravertebral space is basically wedge shaped space. It is formed anteriorly by the pleura, posteriorly by the superior costal transverse ligament, and medially by the vertebral body, the intervertebral disc, and the intervertebral foramen. It is uh, connected with the intercostal space laterally and medially with the epidural space. So when you inject the drug in the paravertebral space, it will spread cranially, caudally, as well as laterally and the medially. So with a single injection, uh, drug spread up to one to two segment upward uh, cranial and caudal, while medially and laterally it, it varies from patient to patient. Sometimes you will find epidural spread and in some of the patient we have seen that drug spread on the opposite side also. So if we compare e e e uh, ESB with thoracic paravertebral, it is simple. This is the schematic presentation of the ESB versus uh, thoracic paravertebral block. So in ESB, what we see, uh, we see the tra uh, transverse processes of the T4, T5. These are the trapezius, rhomboid major, erector spiny. We hit the transverse process and deposit the drug below the erector spiny muscle uh, and above the transverse process. So that becomes your erector spiny block. Here we require 20 to 25 ml of LA and it's spread in the entire plane. But in paravertebral block, we will go beyond the transverse process. We will go beyond the superior costal transverse ligament. So we'll see how it happens. So here you see that uh, uh, in thoracic paravertebral block, we this is superior costal transverse ligament. This is the pleura. We pierce the superior costal transverse ligament and then deposit the drug beyond it so that pleura get displaced anteriorly. With thoracic paravertebral block, you will block sympathetic fiber also. So there is, it is like a, a unilateral epidural and uh, uh, it, it will uh, give a sympathetic block also. So when you are doing with uh, landmark guided technique, you palpate the C7 spinous process that is most prominent. Then you mark the T1, T2, T3, T4, T5. Go 2.5 centimeter laterally, hit the transverse process, walk up the transverse process, go 1 to 1.5 centimeter and inject the drug. You require multiple injection for, especially when you want to give for surgical an uh, anesthesia, uh, because uh, drug uh, doesn't spread more than one to two segment cranially and caudally. So it is better to go for T2, T4, T6 when you are using for surgical anesthesia. If you have ultrasound, you can check the spread and uh, take your decision accordingly. So this is how I do ultrasound guided uh, uh, para uh, uh, paravertebral block. Uh, I do with uh, 
parasagittal technique with outer plane these are the uh, transverse processes uh, of the patient this is the pleura and this is superior costal transverse ligament and here you can see my needle is coming out of plane uh, i will advance the needle and check the tissue movement here you can see the movement i will advance the needle up to the superior costal transverse ligament now i'm i started in injecting the drug and you can see it is pushing the pleura uh, anteriorly so uh, once pleura get this press anteriorly your drug is in the right place and your drug will spread you can see drug has spread at one space two space higher and it spreads cordially also so if you are ultrasound you can check the spread and you can take the decision accordingly so why esbs come over thoracic by esbs basically simple it is easy to perform with or without ultrasound and it is safe because you are away from the pleura so there are less chances of pneumothorax and there is no hypotension as compared to thoracic paravertebral block a mechanism of action basically with esb you deposit the drug posterior to the uh, transverse process and below the uh, erector spinae muscle so if you deposit the drug at the tip of the transverse process it is said that uh, it will definitely block the dorsal root but drug will slowly seep into the paravertebral space to, through the this uh, uh, area uh, this uh, recess between superior costal transverse ligament so slowly drug will seep inside the thoracic paravertebral block space and it will give effect similar to uh, thoracic paravertebral block but if you deposit the drug too medially there are chances that uh, you will miss the ventral root and that there will be no analgesia but uh, nowadays studies are coming that uh, if you put a uh, catheter in the erector spinae space and if you can't uh, keep uh, intermittent bolus is uh, there, there are chances that uh, you will have a better effect because you are giving, giving intermittent bolus is this was the another theory where they were saying that uh, there is a uh costo transverse uh, foramen through that drug goes into the uh, paravertebral space so there are various theories we are not sure which is true which is wrong but uh, erector spine block definitely works in some of the patient drug goes inside the paravertebral space uh, but you should deposit the drug at the tip of the transverse process this is the block video of the erector spine block you can see this is the erector spine muscle this is trapezius rhomboids and erector spine muscle so you should hit the transverse process and simply deposit the drug and drug will nicely spread in the entire plane because this is a uh, uh, facial plane and you require single injection only and you have to deposit 20 to 25 ml of la uh, to cover the t2 t1 to t6 segments tex1 tex2 blocks and sap blocks uh, they are described by rafal blanco in 2014 and 2050 2016 they basically block pectoral nerves intercostal nerves and long thoracic and thoracodorsal nerve so indication pex1 block you should use it in uh, uh, patient with breast implant or pacemaker or a portacast insertion pex2 block is indicated in mrm with axillary dissection because uh, it blocks up to t2 to t6 while sap you can use Uh, where dissection is more later like ld flap reconstruction or it can be used in multiple rib fracture also sap provide analgesia uh, from t2 to t9 along with thoracodorsal nerve while pex2 t2 to t5 and th- long thoracic nerve while pex1 gives uh, blo- uh, blocks the uh, uh, lateral pectoral nerve and the medial pectoral nerve so technique uh, as i said we have to inject 10 ml of la between pectoral major and pec minor in pex1 block in pex2 you have to inject at least 20 ml because you want to spread drug from t2 to t6 so you have to deposit is it 20 ml of la while if you use sap inject 20 to 25 ml of la between latissimus dorsi and serratus anterior or uh, in deep sap block you can deposit the drug between uh, rib and the serratus anterior so basically these are high volume block Uh, you have you can combine either pex1 and pex2 or pex1 and sap uh, to provide complete analgesia but again supraclavicular nerves are spare so for that you require some local infiltration and anterior cutaneous branches we will see the next block so when you are doing pec block you should start scanning from clavicle you put the probe at the mid of mid of the clavicle you will see the clavicle you will see the axillary vessel this is pec major muscle when you move the probe downward 
you should tilt the probe little medially so that you can see the ribs. This is the rib, this is the rib, and this is the pleura. You will see two muscles, pec major and pec minor. And be, in between that, you will find the pectoral branch of thoracoacromial thoraco artery. If you find that you are in the right plane, you should deposit the drug there, and you will block the lateral and medial pectoral nerve. And here, when you inject the drug here, be, between serratus and serratus anterior, is a very thin muscle here. So if you deposit the drug between pec minor and serratus anterior, it becomes your pecs to block. Here, you can see this is small strip of serratus anterior at the level of fourth strip and you inject the drug here and it becomes your uh, pex 2 block so this is pex 1 and this is pex 2 for lattice, uh, serratus anterior plane block uh, in superficial block you deposit the drug between latissimus dorsi and serratus anterior when you put the probe in the mid to posterior axillary line at the fifth or sixth rib you will find this structure, latissimus dorsi, serratus anterior, and the rib. So if you deposit the drug here between two muscles, then it becomes your superficial step. And if you deposit the drug here, it becomes your deep uh, step block. Basically, intercostal now, lateral cutaneous branches come from here to here. So whether you deposit the drug here or here, it will block the lateral cutaneous branches. So these are two types of block. We'll see the video again, pex one and step block video. So, indication, as I said, MRM, PEX1 block video initially. So, first, how to scanning? We should start scanning from the clavicle, start from mid clavicular line, look for PEC major and PEC minor at third, third or fourth rib, and deposit the drug between. Here, you can see this is the clavicle, these are the subclavian vessels, and you can see the PEC major and PEC minor. These are the ribs. This is pec major, pec minor. So this is the target where we deposit. And here you can see the artery pulsating between these two muscles. So you can see the arterial pulsation between two muscles. So you have to come in plane from cranial to podal, and you should go a little bit laterally because your probe will tilt a bit laterally. So you deposit the drug between two muscles, and that becomes your X1 block. So here you will see my needle will come in plane. You can see my needle is coming from this side. You can see some tissue movement. We will try to see the needle tip all throughout so that you don't go too deeper. Here you can see now I can see the needle tip. I'm slowly advancing the needle towards the plane between pex major and pex minor. I'm closer to the artery, so I will take care that I don't puncture it. I'll pierce the membrane and inject the drug. So I started injecting the drug and after one ml of LA, I'm readjusting and you can see the drug spread. So this is how you give PEX1 block. You can see the drug spread now. For SEP block, uh, scanning, uh, go laterally up to mid to posterior axillary line, look for tip six, identify two muscles and inject between two muscles. So we'll see how to do it. So here you can see these are two muscles and this is the target area. So this is one muscle, this is two muscle. Again, we will come in plane. You, you can go from the cranial to caudal side. You can make the probe little oblique so that you can get space to insert the needle because if it is in the uh, vertical plane, it, then it is difficult to insert the needle. Here you can see the entire needle shaft and needle tip. I am slowly advancing the needle tip. You can see a small pulsation that is again uh, arterial pulsation, thoracolosal artery. And that is an indication that you are in the right plane. And I'm slow. I've started injecting the drug slowly inside the plane. Once I get the proper plane, I will a little bit advance the needle and inject 20 to 25 ml of LA. PEX1 and PEX2 block. Again, we will see the video of both the blocks simultaneously. So this is, you can see PEC major and PEC minor muscle. You can see the arterial pulsation here. My needle is coming. Ideally, we should give uh, PEX2 block primarily so that the remaining muscle get lifted. Here I have given PEX1 block initially, so it is not ideal thing. Uh, but I, you can see I'm redirecting the needle so that I can see the shaft. Once I'm in the right plane, I'll inject 10 ml of LA there. You can see the duct spread. I'm not properly in the plane, so I'm a bit advanced in the needle. And now you can see the plane is getting nicely separated. So once I inject the drug there, 10 ml of LA there, then I will go for PEX2 block. 
and here is this is cirrhosis anterior this is pec minor so this is the target area where i where i will inject the drug so you will see the drug spread here also so once i started injecting the drug you can see drug is nicely spreading in the plane so this is how you can give pex1 and pex2 block as i said anterior cutaneous branches get spared even with this block so for that we require pectoral intercostal plane block or transverse thoracic plane block so when you inject the drug between pec major and and the rib plane between these two then it becomes your uh, pectoral intercostal plane block and if you go deeper into between transverse thoracic muscle and the intercostal muscle then it becomes your transverse thoracic muscle pain block but here you will find the memory internal thoracic vein and the artery so you can injure this vein so it is always better to go for superficial approach so this is the superficial approach and this is the deep approach this one is the deep approach so you can use either to provide the uh, anterior cutaneous branches analgesia or simply you can infiltrate in the parietal area to complete the block supra uh, clavicular now as i said they travel just about the clavicular uh, and there are multiple branches so you have to just infiltrate infiltrate about the clavicular five to seven of L is enough, and it will block this now, and it will cover this area. Now, these are with ultrasound. So, can we give this block with a landmark guided technique? Yes, you can give all this block with landmark guided technique. So, I'll show first landmark of guided ESB block. It is simple because we just hit the rib, uh, hit the transverse process, and inject the drug. So, when you give uh, landmark guided erector spiny block. you have to simply go 3 cm lateral to the uh, midline and hit the transverse process and inject the drug why 3 cm because uh, when you go 3 cm lateral you are on the tip of the transverse process roughly so inject 25 ml of uh, there we have published this paper also i will show the that paper link also uh, so you you can see this is the midline i am inserting the needle Three centimeter later to the midline. Once I hit the transverse process, I will inject the drug. If I don't get transverse process, I will go cranially cordially and try to find out the transverse process and then inject the drug. So after careful aspiration, inject the drug. Always attach syringe to the uh, extension tube while locating the space because if you accidentally puncture the pleura and if you are um extension tubing is open to air then there are chances of pneumothorax because it will, with inspiration uh, air will get sucked inside and which will cause pneumothorax so always at its range uh, while locating the space once you inject 20 ml of la careful aspiration is always important uh, and when we when we come con confirm with ultrasound you can see drug is spread nicely above the uh, transverse process and below the uh, 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 erector spiny muscle so you can give this block very easily with a landmark guided technique or you can use uh, iitv and i will say this is a very good block for spine surgery and you can use it for uh, breast surgery as well uh, this is lor thoracic paravertebral block again you have to mark the spinous processes this work was nephrectomy this is the point 2.5 cm lateral to the midline i'll insert the needle initially we should go for 3 cm if patient is obese you can go more uh, if you get the transverse process that is okay otherwise go cranially or cordially once you get it you walk up the transverse process either cranially or cordially once you get the click of superior costal transverse ligament you can inject the drug so i got the click and when i started injecting drug and check with ultrasound you can see nice spread of the drug in the thoracic paravert and i'll i'll say it is a simpler block with uh, landmark guided technique as compared to ultrasound guided technique uh, so you can very well give it with landmark guided technique uh, now mm, next is pns guided pex1 block basically we, here we are stimulating the uh, pectoral nerves you must have seen the uh, pectoral muscle pectoral muscle contraction while giving the uh, intraclavicular block so you can block uh, initially stimulate the pectoral pectoral nerve so here i am inserting the needle in the mid, mid 
between the uh, you can see the pop of the prepectoral fascia so this is between uh, mid clavicular line and the mid axillary line on the fourth rib so i i can see the contraction of the pectoral muscle and you can see at 1.1 it disappears so i will readjust the needle again and you can see the contraction nicely so once you get that contraction reduce the current to 0.5 mm and once you get that at 0.5 mm you can inject an ml of la and it, 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 it will see with the uh, uh, we can see that uh, contraction has disappeared and here you can give the drug for pax1 block uh for pns sep block uh, again it is published also we go into mid to posterior axillary line on the fifth or sixth rib and we try to stimulate the long thoracic now so after one pop you will see the contraction of the serratus uh, one pop has gone and once i close i am close to the now you can see the contraction of serratus anterior muscle so once you get it reduce the current to 0.5 mm and inject the drug Uh, 20 ml, 20 to 25 ml of LA uh, at 0.5 milligrams, uh, and once you start injecting the drug because of positive drug test, uh, contraction will disappear, and you inject 20 ml of LA, 20 to 25 ml of LA, and it works really nicely. And if you confirm with ultrasound, your drug will in the right plane. Um, this is the LOR PEX2 block. Again, it is a very simple block uh, with LOR technique also. because uh, uh, there is a prepectoral fascia and the fascia between pec major and pec minor so we have to fill the pop of those two fascia so initially i will try to locate the fourth rib and between the mid clavicular and the uh, mid uh, anterior axillary line i will try to locate the rib i attach the syringe to the needle so that if i accidentally puncture the pleura there is no pneumothorax so initially sometimes you don't get because breast is a fatty area and it is difficult now i am on the rib you can see it so i will withdraw the needle up to the skin and then i will fill the pop of uh, prepectoral fascia and once i fill the pop and advance the needle and uh, now i am getting the second resistance i will start injecting the drug again i will advance the needle and hit the rib and inject 20 ml of ala there so after injecting this drug i confirm with uh, uh, ultrasound whether the drug was in the right plane or not and i found that i was in the right plane so you can see this is the drug between pec major and pec minor i'll show here you can see there is nice spread of the drug between two muscle and then i check with uh, for pec minor and, and you can see the drug here as well so with uh, 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 landmark guided technique also this block can be given same way with lor sep block this is a long video because this was a very obese patient so this is basically mid clavicular line and uh, 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 sorry mid axillary line and the post axillary line i am on the sick i am trying to palpate the sixth rib when patient is uh, obese you have to palpate dip uh, so that you can feel the rib uh, these are all live videos i have not edited anything uh, so i took almost 1.5 minute to look at the rib you can see still i am not on the rib after 1.5 minutes so but you have to connect the syringe to the extension tubing while locating the rib once you hit the rib you inject the drug and you will in the right plane so after expiration inject the drug and if you confirm with ultrasound you can see drug has spread nicely between rib and the uh, serratus anterior muscle so with landmark guided technique you can give sep block also so all this blocks can be given with uh, landmark guided technique will uh, you will ask whether there is any evidence for this technique because in literature you will find that these blocks are described with uh, uh, ultrasound guided technique also this is the paper we have published that is serratus anterior plane block with anatomical landmark guided technique and there is another study also which is published after this this is landmark guided erector spiny block and there are two papers now this is pns guided the serratus anterior plane block uh, and this is peripheral nerve stimulator guided pex1 block so these are the new blocks which can be given with pns or landmark guided technique but we should remember that uh, these blocks are part of multimodal analgesia they don't provide complete analgesia only thoracic paravertebral and thoracic epidural can provide the surgical analgesia so if you want to Uh, do surgery in high risk patient under anesthesia uh, under regional anesthesia only then you should go either for thoracic epidural or for thoracic peripheral block remaining block are for 
the somatic innervation only and they provide uh, uh, analgesia but you have to combine with other drugs these are high volume blocks so you have to uh, suppose if you are giving a pex1 along with sep you require 30 to 40 ml of la so better to dilute the drug like you can use 0.25% bupivacaine and ropivacaine and accordingly you can use it thoracic segment spinal anesthesia this is emerging like anything in our country here they are using isobaric drug and they are injecting the drug at the level of t5 t6 or at even at higher level uh, conventionally we were taught that uh, spinal is given below the l1 only but uh, now they are they have come with mir study also where they they proved that uh, there is enough space uh, behind the core in the thoracic area also uh, but here angle will be 50 degrees so you have to slowly advance the needle and you should uh, uh, make it confirm that you don't injure the cord so slowly there are study coming up with uh, this technique also but uh, frankly speaking i haven't used for uh, breast surgeries uh, i prefer ga along with blocks only um, prospect guideline for oncological breast surgery. These are basically guidelines. Uh, the, the, the aim of this guideline would, was to evaluate an avail available literature and develop recommendation for optimal pain management after oncological breast surgery. They have developed guideline for oral surgery like uh, knee surgery or uh, abdominal surgery. So they have prepared guideline with uh, available literature and for breast, they say that. Uh, uh, recommendation are for minor surgery preoperatively we should go for paracetamol and uh, conventional NSAID or COX-2 selective inhibitor. You can give gabapentin and it has got grade A evidence. Dexamethasone is very good. It prolongs the blocks effect. It reduces the inflammation so uh, uh, it improves the post-operative pain relief and uh, local anesthetic wound infiltration can also given. In post-operative period, it, they said that paracetamol along with uh, NSAIDs or COX-2 inhibitor can be given and opioids should be used as a rescue block, uh, rescue analgesia. Uh, for major breast surgery, they recommend that in preoperative period, we should give paracetamol along with NSAID or COX-2 Box to inhibitor, gabapentin again, dexamethasone. They recommended intraoperatively paracetamol block as grade A evidence. But when it is uh, uh, it is contraindicated because it is a deep block, if a patient is on antiplatelet, uh, it is contraindicated, then we should go for PEX block and local anesthetic infiltration also works. post op again, paracetamol with uh, NSAID or COX-2 inhibitor, opioids as rescue, and we can continue, give continue paracetamol block by putting the catheter also. So these are the prospect guidelines for uh, pain management in the uh, oncological breast surgery. We'll talk very short, uh, in very brief uh, about the post-mastectomy pain syndrome and chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, chronic post-surgical pain is it has got very high incidence, like 20 to 50 percent of the patients have chronic uh, post-surgical pain in the thoracic uh, breast surgery patients. So it is quite high. So if we provide uh, preemptive analysis, it, it was initially thought that it may prevent the chronic post-surgical pain by limiting the nervous system remodeling. And when we use multimodal approach, anti-inflammatory drug are used for primary hyperalgesia by regional anesthesia for secondary hyperalgesia. It may limit transition from acute to chronic pain in certain study. Like he, here in this study, they say that where palatable block, uh, they conclude that uh, CPS peak was not found significantly prevented by PVV after BCS, despite limitation in, in, included in the study. While well, well, nevertheless, PVB could prevent CPSNP by impeding the transition from acute to chronic pain. So if you treat the acute pain uh, timely, uh, you can prevent the chronic pain up to certain extent. Next is anesthetic technique and breast cancer rec recurrence. There are many unanswered questions. It came like anything in the last decade. Uh, but after prospective trials, they found that it uh, it doesn't affect much. Uh, uh, what was the theory? Basically, they tell the, uh, told that volatile anesthetic drug surgery and, uh, and surgical stress would lead to activation of uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and it will affect the sympathetic nervous system also. But if you provide regional anesthesia and paravertebral block or epidural block, 
it will prevent activation of this axis. If this axis get activated, it will lead to neuroendocrine mediator release, which will suppress the cell mediated immunity and which will lead to the uh, enhancement of the metastasis and chances of recurrence get increased. Opioids again suppress this the cell mediated immunity while uh, total intravenous anesthesia with propofol again uh, prevents such suppression of the cell mediated immunity. Okay. So, uh, hypothesis was propofol anesthesia as uh, along with regional block will prevent the recur uh, chances of uh, recurrence, while opioids and volatile anesthetic drug will increase the chances of recurrence. But uh, when they, do, they did the pros prospective study, uh, it was concluded that uh, it is not that beneficial. So, last part, how I do it. I use opioids as pre-medication. I usually use... Uh, 50 to 100 microgram of uh, fentanyl along with dexmedetropinin. Dexmedetropinin, I will say it is a wonderful drug. It provides excellent intraoperative analgesia along with opioids. It maintains hemodynamics. You will have a stable blood pressure like uh, 70, 80 mean blood pressure along with uh, heart rate control and so surgeon will have an excellent surgical field. Uh, Endotracheal tube versus eye gel. I usually pr prefer endotracheal tube because they cover the uh, head with uh, drugs while doing the breast surgery. So sometimes when the eye gel gets dislodged, it becomes uh, very difficult. So I prefer endotracheal tube as compared to eye gel. I use sevoflurane in all my cases. Thoracic parotidal block is block of my choice. We use it routinely. But sometimes when there is a long list, we can go for PEX along with SEP because uh, thoracic parotidal block, uh, require, uh, you need to change the position after induction of the anesthesia uh, and it takes a little longer time. Multimodal anesthesia, I prefer to give um, NSAID along with paracetamol in the, at the end of the surgery along with uh, tramodol and it works well for me. So uh, my patients are usually pain-free in the post-operative period and uh, uh, with the help of uh, parotidal block and dexmedotomid uh, hemodynamics are quite stable. Patient uh, surgeon will have a good surgical field. There is no uh, bleeding, uh, bleeding and uh, very good uh, surgical field. So to conclude the thing, prevalence of breast cancer is increasing all across the group. Surgery can involve the primary removal of the lesion and reconstruction. Preoperative assessment, that is very important. You should look for the uh, chemotherapeutic agent used and uh, any neoadjuvant therapy used. We should talk to the patient to allay anxiety and identifying, uh, uh, we should identify the potential intraoperative issues also. Pectoral blocks and SEP block provide good analgesia for daycare procedure, but I will say parotidal block is a gold standard. Ongoing research is investigating anesthetic technique as and their effect on the cancer recurrence, uh, but still there is no um, enough, not enough evidence. So this is all about uh, breast surgery and anesthesia. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you have any question, you can ask. Excellent presentation. I should absolutely say uh, a fantastic teacher. You have covered the landmark uh, procedures the peripheral nerve stimulator and the ultrasound guided techniques so beautifully. Excellent. And Thank you, through your lectures, we could see you are a very safe anesthesiologist, starting from saying, don't start an IV line on the same side of the surgery and always go for an endotracheal tube instead of an eye gel. So you are excellent. Excellent answer. We have one question from Dr. Abhishek Nag, and he says, what is the percentage prevention of chance of can cancer recurrence with propofol-based anesthesia. Actually, uh, they found some 20% uh, of the um, difference between uh, propofol anesthesia as well as uh, opioids uh, uh, when they were using sevoflurane along with the opioids. But it was a retrospective study. So they went for prospective surgery at multi-centers. And after doing that uh, prospective surgery in 2011 or so, they found that uh, there is no difference, actual difference between recurrence rate between do, these two techniques. So there is not enough evidence because of um, a micro 
uh, scopic anatomy and all these factors, they thought that they, it might affect the recurrence rate. Uh, but when they went for the prospective study, there is actually no difference between those these two techniques. Okay, so good, sir. Uh, this is my question. What would be yes, the choice please. of your local anesthetics which you will choose, sir? You said I you usual, would... Yeah, I usually use, madam, ropivacin in all my patients. I stopped using uh, bupivacin in my patients uh, since last 10 years or so. I use ropivacin exclusively in all my patients. Uh, consultation depends on whether you want to use it for uh, analgesia or for surgical anesthesia. And all these blocks are given uh, before the surgical surgery starts. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And for post-op analgesia, we will rather concentrate on opioids, isn't it, sir? Um, post-operative analgesia usually... Paracetamol, is, NSAIDs. Yeah, para, paracetamol, NSAIDs and tramadol is sufficient because in breast surgery, when they go for MRM, usually no endings are also getting cut along with the dissection. So they don't get initially much of pain. So it can be controlled initially. Initial 12 hours can be controlled with your regional block. Then you can very well control it with NSAID along with paracetamol in these patients. Okay. So any additives do you add along with your local anesthetic mixture? I, I use uh, intravenous dexamethasone in all my patients. And there is a study where they said that whether you give dexamethasone IV or along with the regional anesthesia, yes. Yes. And duration of action is similar. It's the same. Yeah, is it the same? same? Okay. So you yes. prefer going with IV dexmed and uh, Dexa dexamethasone. At IV dexamethasone. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Yes, sir. So we we do not, I think we do not have any further questions. Any sir, challenging cases? Comments. Sir? We, we have some comments in the chat box. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, it's Nowadays, lignocaine is injected in the six quadrants around the mass, decreases recurrence. This is from Dr. Manisha. Uh, Manish, uh, Mani, Manisha Ghosh, madam. Manisha yes, madam, Ghosh, madam. I, I read that study, but uh, there are not enough cases to prove these things. Uh, they say that uh, injecting the lignocaine will reduce the recurrence rate, uh, but still not very, uh, there is not, not enough evidence to prove that theory. And another question is like uh, thoracic parameter yeah. before G or after Before G, G or after G. So uh, I give it after G only in lateral position. If a surgery is under uh, regional anesthesia only, obviously it is before uh, under local anesthesia only, but uh, all my blocks is after G only. So I think that uh, sums uh, up. Uh, Dr. I, I have a query. Uh, is there any role for uh, parameter catheter placement for bus surgeries? Oh, I have never put the paramedical catheter for breast surgery, but uh, recently I uh, came across a study where they used uh, ESB catheter for breast surgery. And uh, they say that uh, analgesia is better if you put a ESB catheter, but I haven't put any catheter for breast surgery because uh, pain is not that much uh, in breast surgery patient after 24 hours or so. Okay, okay sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was an excellent, uh, excellent uh, presentation and it was beautiful listening to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So, we will go on to our next uh, uh, speaker and uh, she is Dr. Preeta Raj and she is an assistant professor. Uh, she is working, uh, presently working at the RER Cancer Institute, Chennai, and uh, she will be telling us about the airway uh, uh, um, uh, oncological proce procedures. Uh, madam, a very good morning good to morning. you, madam. Yes, good morning, ma'am. Good morning so much. So we are waiting to hear from you, madam. My pleasure being here. I would like to thank you for this great opportunity and also would like to say Hethel sir's presentation was wonderful to listen to. And um, without further ado, I will go on to the presentation. So, Madam will be talking about anesthesia for upper airway malignancies. So, Ma yes, this, we see uh, your... visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
going on to how i do it first i would like to give a brief overview of what exactly uh, i'll be talking about what exactly is the problem that we face in upper airway malignancies so we will speak about the surgical overview of what, what all diseases uh, where all the malignancy can occur and what treatment options are available and what how we can help in that and how do we prepare these patients for surgery and and uh, how exactly to go about anesthesia and what uh, are the clinical scenarios that we face and how i did it in these scenarios so moving on uh, the head and neck cancers are a very common malignancies noted in india especially and is about 26% in males and 8% in females and there are multiple risk factors associated with these patients which includes uh, uh, smoking uh, chronic alcoholism and also there is history of uh, smoke exposure or uh, sawdust exposure which further uh, predisposes these patients to malignancies of the nasal cavity especially and uh, there is also a viral association with hpv and epstein barr virus moving on to the next screen one second yeah uh, so where do these malignancies predominantly occur it, it it can involve anywhere from the nasal cavity to the paranasal sinuses and the oral cavity which includes the lips the tongue and that is the anterior two thirds of the tongue the gingivum the buccal mucosa and uh, going further down to the oropharynx which includes the tonsils and also the soft palate and uh, the uh, uh, oral surface of the epiglottis and the valvular and hypopharynx which involves the piriform fossa the uh, posterior pharyngeal wall and further down the larynx and the epiglottis and vocal cords i'll be discussing only up to the level of the vocal cords since that uh, constitutes the upper airway so this uh, shows where all these malignancies can happen that is the nasal cavity the as i explained earlier so the disease spread is as in most malignancies it can spread either by local invasion or by blood or also through nodes sometimes patients present only with a nodal swelling and they usually do not have other symptoms and they are incidentally detected malignancies but commonly the symptoms that they come with are dysphagia or dinophagia or a chronic ulcer which is not healing which is infective bleeding and also they have complaints such as change in voice or risk, uh, or history of repeated aspirations and rarely they present their uh, uh, they complain of difficulty in breathing while exertion during exertion which might present with mild stridor or mild stridor on exertion or which might present with uh, severe stridor which usually happens when patients come with recurrence so the treatment options are three pronged we have surgery surgery radiation and chemotherapy some surgeries do not really mandate surgery they might be taken up with chemotherapy and radiation itself but uh, mo most surgeries uh, mo most malignancies require a combination of these three modalities and the uh, common chemotherapeutic agents that we uh, that uh, oncologists use for these malignancies are cisplatin or carboplatin paclitaxel docetaxel and 5-fluorouracil so uh, this is a brief overview of the surgeries that are entailed in the uh, management of these malignancies like nasopharyngeal uh, malignancy usually does not require surgery and is mostly managed with chemo and radiation while nasal cavity and paranasal sinus requires uh, surgery such as endoscopic uh, surgery that is like a fest itself or wide local excision or ma involving maxillectomies this might involve a flap also oral cavity lesions usually surgery and radiation are the mainstay of treatment wherein there is a wide excision of the uh, mass and also nodal dissection and based on the defect a local flap that is a myocutaneous flap might be used or a free flap which involves a, a pedicle flap based on the radial artery uh, or a um, alt flap that is from the thigh it might be used to augment the defect uh, lesions involving the oropharynx might involve uh, surgery such as wide local excision with neck dissection or with the upcoming surgery such as transoral robotic surgeries so in our institute we practice, we uh, also take up robotic surgeries i'll briefly discuss about it further and in hypopharynx we also uh, in the that is the upper end of the uh, digestive tract so this involves a laryngopharyngectomy because the disease usually involves a larynx also a part of the pharynx a part of the la uh, total laryngectomy is usually done in these cases and uh, a partial uh, laryngopharyngectomy can be done and for surgeries uh, that is disease involving the upper end of the esophagus a uh, lar uh, laryngopharyngoesophagectomy is also done in uh, malignancy involving the larynx uh, minimal minimal disease can be addressed by transoral laser surgery which is minimal but uh, which uh, extensive uh, disease will will require laryngectomy with neck dissection 
this is in conjunction with further tra- treatment with chemo or radiation they might be treated with uh, chemo and then come for surgery or they may have undergone radiation and come for surgery so this, this is a very important point to note because uh, this impacts our airway management significantly so coming now to the challenges we often face uh, we often face a patient who is malnourished and they come with a uh, history of re- exposure to chemotherapy and exposure to radiation and this poses multiple problems because uh, such patients are usually chronic uh, uh, have history of chronic alcohol usage or cr- chronic tobacco usage which puts them at risk higher risk of malnutrition because of poor oral intake and uh, micronutrient deficiencies and uh, because of uh, um, chemotherapy exposure they also have low appetite and because of the malignancy itself they are uh, they face cancer cachexia which further uh, affects oral intake and also because of radiation exposure there is uh, fibrosis and there is some uh, there is uh, restriction of the jaw movement because of which oral intake further comes down so this impacts significantly i'll explain further and also the airway is compromised because of exposure because of the disease per se that is uh, because it occurs in the upper airway this will distort the anatomy in multiple ways as we'll see further and uh, they might present with respiratory distress which often needs an emergency airway and uh, we are at the forefront of handling this uh, these patients usually also have multiple other comorbidities and this, this malignancy is often common in elderly age groups or in poor socio economic status patients as well and so the other comorbidities commonly include uh, copd the diabetes hypertension and coronary artery disease also which needs to be addressed uh finally coming to the surgical part they have, the, the surgery often is quite extensive and also requires a shared airway with the surgeon uh, therefore uh, needing hyper vigilance on our part and these patients also have significant pain so they are already on prescription drugs such as morphine and there is a risk of opioid dependence and also there is alcohol dependence or tobacco dependence which also needs to be addressed with a psycho oncological backup finally we'll discuss about uh, we also face uh, uh, dilemmas regarding extubation when do we extubate these patients and what are the crises we can anticipate so we'll discuss on that also so malnutrition as i said it's very important to address because they are often anemic and uh, they have severe dyslipidemia because of poor oral intake and statistics have shown that these patients when malnourished have a higher history a higher incidence of unexpected hospitalizations and also it has a poorer impact on recovery from surgery and prolonged length of stay in the hospital Uh, so what we need to know as anesthesiologists is we have to note the dyselectrolytemia which we will pick up usually on the pac and that has to be optimized because when uh, when we then reinitiate uh, feeding enteral feeding they are at higher risk of refeeding syndrome that presents with further worsening of dyselectrolytemia such as hypokalemia hypophosphatemia and hypomagnesemia and cardiac decompensation can also ha- happen in these patients so when they are chronically malnourished or there is a weight loss of more than 10% we have to be very vigilant about this entity and also uh, request the surgical team or uh, involve the diet, uh, dietary department also to uh, further counsel these patients and also uh, initiate nutritional recommendations and we also start them on or uh, anti uh, that is oral hematemics to improve the hemoglobin also so mostly they require enteral feeding only and that can be achieved by placing a nasogastric tube in the case that is not possible or they are severely malnourished admitting these patients and uh, hydrating them and then uh, correcting the electrolyte disturbance and then supplementing with parenteral nutrition really helps uh chemotherapy and radio th- radiotherapy have significant impact on anesthetic management and you uh, i will just talk briefly on why how we uh, what we need to keep in mind uh, usually the most common side effects of the agents used are myelosuppression and cardiomyopathy and neuropathy so these uh, uh, so it becomes important to note the uh, hemogram when they come for surgery usually the counts are low and these patients present with uh, present for surgery within 2 to 3 weeks of chemotherapy exposure so that has to be optimized and if required medical oncological review should be sought and also very important to note take a 2d echo post chemo exposure to know the cardiac status radiation uh, radiation ha- has a very uh, vast impact on the airway because uh, uh, it's actually given to the head and neck region only so then uh, it causes uh, changes in the airway such as uh, fibrosis uh, first it causes mucosal edema and there is inflammation due to radiation and also there is uh, uh, because of the edema the tongue becomes a bit more fixed 
and there is a, a epiglottic edema also which happens mucosal edema happens and there is contraction of these tissues and also mandibular osteoradial necrosis happens which worsens the trismus that might actually already be present and because of the fibrosis of the neck surgical landmarks become very obscured and presents as a woody induration this has multiple implications because uh, this uh, rigidity which produ is produced by radiation does not get released by muscle relaxation and therefore we cannot really anticipate how bad the airway will be after induction most often we see that trismus gets relieved with pain by uh, uh, trismus caused due to pain gets relieved by muscle relaxation but that's not the case with radiation exposure so this causes difficult mask ventilation difficult laryngoscopy difficult, difficult intubation multiple levels of difficulty and also many patients might come to the psc before and then go on for radiation and then come for surgery so it's very important to note the last radiation exposure to be aware of the dynamic change in the airway and uh, as for the comorbidities it is uh, as part of the routine psc that we do and uh, the usual tests are asked for to evaluate the general condition of the patients which includes complete hemogram rft lft electrolytes protein to know the uh, nourishment of the patient blood group serology ecg x ray and 2d echo uh, other lung conditions cardiac conditions need to be optimized often they are smokers patients with emphysema where needed pulmonary uh, uh, pulmonologist opinion must be sought if patients are not there are situations where we have seen patients who are not medically fit to undergo such an extensive surgery where the surgeons were not even aware of these issues and based on that a risk benefit ratio analysis or uh, discussion with the family further led to them undergoing uh, chemo and radiation as a primary uh, treatment instead of surgery so that also happens so now coming to the crux of this uh, talk today airway management so uh, there are many challenges but this is the main problem we face with head and neck malignancies we'll briefly see how we can plan the airway safely so that this, uh, we can you know take care of the patient through and through so uh, first uh, how do we plan this basically uh, the planning starts from the time when the patient comes to the psc and we have uh, the there are a lot of imaging which is done as part of the malignancy workup by the surgical team itself that that itself will give you all the information you need for planning the anesthesia uh, planning the airway for the patient so and it's also very important to be a team player and discuss with the surgeon as to what exact modality is plan what exactly is planned for the uh, surgical uh, treatment itself what is required during the surgery and uh, what are the options that we can use whether they want uh, to retain the tube whether they would like to extubate on table we were, uh, we usually discuss and also uh, it is important to know where all we can encounter the difficulty so that we can keep our resources available based on that so uh, what are the common causes which complicate a uh, airway in a head and neck malignancy include the treatment per se that is radiation itself causes changes and many patients come with recurrence so they would have already undergone a few surgeries before that can complicate surgery by the uh, complicate the airway multiple times in the present scenario they also might have comorbidities such as diabetes rheumatoid arthritis or cervical spondylosis which will further complicate your decision making and the malignancy itself as i said it can have the patients can have poor mouth opening with, that is trismus poor dental conditions submucosal fibrosis vocal cord lesions or friable lesions in the oral cavity which will impair your access to the airway itself and the anatomy that is post radiation also surgical anatomy or landmarks can be uh, disfigured and other normal and anatomical issues such as receding jaw uh, increased buccal pad of fat obesity can also complicate the difficult airway scenario and physiologically elderly patients are known to have more difficult airways so this was found in a study that i went i found while i was going through for this presentation that uh, these are the common factors which include uh, uh, which increase the difficult which uh, cause a difficulty in these patients they are elderly with comorbid conditions and anatomical uh, uh, variations as, as well and the malignancy itself so this uh, i we had collected a few images of patients that usually we see these are not exact images of patients i have seen but similar to what we see uh, with submucosal mucosal fibrosis with poor dental conditions with negligible mouth opening or uh, with a restricted mouth opening where you can't where, where it's a gray zone whether it should we go for awake intubation or a, a sleep intubation and uh, post radiation neck where there is the anatomical landmarks are also very obscure that even the surgeon finds it difficult to go for a electrotracheostomy 
so coming to the airway plan how do we go, decide upon this uh, clinically clinical examination is very important though it might sometimes be redundant but nevertheless it is important to do it look at uh, a usual uh, malampatti classification should be undertaken if mouth opening is adequate or not and uh, for jaw movement jaw protrusion and tongue protrusion because many times the disease itself can cause infiltration and ankyloglossia and if possible note the site of the lesion extent of the lesion and also ask for history whether the patient has any difficulty in breathing because of uh, since the onset of disease and any uh, uh, possibility of bleeding and uh, relevant imaging and the last date of the relevant imaging is very important to note because always remember that cancer is a very dynamic disease that the, the there are cases where investigations were done 10 days ago and when the patient came for surgery the disease had progressed and the airway had become difficult so the airway plan completely changed on table uh, so always look for endoscopic findings often head and neck malignancies they are uh, definitely evaluated by a video uh, nasal endoscopy which is done preoperatively so note these findings to know what is the site of the lesion how bad is it how vascular it is and also the glottic chain and the vocal cord status so uh, this is a brief uh, uh, summary i found of the uh, sequelae of head and neck cancer treatment that is uh, as i've already discussed another important point to note in radiation damage to the airway include that there is ba baroreceptor damage also might be present which will cause autonomic instability and also these patients usually have hypothyroidism also because of radiation exposure so that also has to be optimized prior to surgery Uh, and neck dissection uh, patients who have undergone neck dissection they might also have injury undiagnosed injuries to the uh, nerves uh, low cranial nerves such as the glossopharyngeal and uh, tenth cranial nerve you know, because of close proximity to the nodal structures in the neck so uh, the goals of airway management first and foremost is keep it as simple and safe as possible at all times safety of the patient is most important and very important to be a team player and ask for help so these are the basic crux as in any difficult airway this is what we practice if a difficult airway is anticipated and and in these patients most of the times it is an anticipated difficult airway so please have backup at all times so our goal is to ensure patient's comfort and cooperation so this we achieve by uh, speaking to the patient beforehand as to what they can expect and to provide a clear surgical field uh, during surgery and ensure uninterrupted oxygenation and ventilation uh it it is it, even it has been mandated in the uh, uh, difficult airway algorithms as well it's not safe to have a single plan have multiple plans uh, a plan a plan b plan c there should be a clear communication as to which uh, i mean if one plan fails it should be a seamless transition to the next plan uh, and always be aware that you are sharing an airway with the surgeon and that has to be the first priority uh, at all points of time during the surgery so there are multiple factors that can increase the risk of an unanticipated intubation or a failed intubation so for this it is very important to keep the patient's safety as a first priority and to not try any new techniques in a difficult airway and always keep a experienced person in the loop of your information uh, in in the situation and to involve take their help and be aware that the airway status is very dynamic be aware of that at all points of time so how i go about it i usually define the obstacle which is which i am likely to face in this situation so based on the patient's uh, uh, surgical lesion itself we will know whether there can be a difficult mask ventilation or will mask ventilation be possible or not so define it as difficult uh, mask ventilation possible or not and laryngoscopy will it be conventional laryngoscopy will be suitable for the patient or not based on the mouth opening and also if i need video laryngoscopy i would get those equipments ready for the intubation of the patient and also if these are not possible uh, how, do i go with awake intubation or asleep intubation how do i do that and based on the surgical landmarks if all the above factors are not feasible then i would keep the uh, discuss with the surgeon for a awake tracheostomy as far as possible always uh, um, would also look for the uh, feasibility of front of neck access when it is not uh, when everything else fails and a front of neck access is required that also needs to be kept at the back of mind okay and uh, backup is uh, always have an experienced anesthetist also available with you at least in the nearby ot you can inform that i am going ahead with this patient if needed i will need you for help so the options available to me uh, options usually available are routine ga 
that is in an uncomplicated airway go for nasotracheal or orotracheal intubation uh, usually based on the surgical requirement different laryngoscopes can be used and uh, based on your skill or based on the uh, uh, based on the examination of the patient and the next option available is uh, awake laryngoscopy where there is a gray zone where there should we go for uh, a normal conventional laryngoscopy or uh, fiber optic intubation and awake laryngoscopy can be attempted but uh, in this situation it is very important to be aware that bag and mask ventilation should be definitely possible so topicalize the airway and with minimal sedation a video laryngoscopy can be done a checkscopy as we usually say to look at the uh, Uh, oral cavity and to look at the glottic structures if intubation will be possible then comes the gold standard which is awake fob and uh, based on the skill of the operating anesthesiologist we can decide whether you want to go ahead with asleep or awake intubation finally there are elective tracheostomy which is the safest of possible options and pre and patients coming in with previous tracheostomy we often change over to a reinforced tube because uh, uh, handling structures is more difficult with a tracheostomy during surgery and usually in uh, these malig upper airway malignancies a retrograde intubation is not really preferred and submental intubations are a relative contraindication because they carry higher risk of development of orocutaneous fistula so we usually don't practice this technique so here i just want to add a word about video laryngoscopes they they are uh, becoming more popular now because they have a higher incidence of uh, a successful intubation in the very first attempt compared to conventional laryngoscopy but there is something very important to note to take it with a pinch of salt the kind of video laryngoscope you have will definitely influence the uh, success ratio that you success you will uh, face with intubation uh, so here what we commonly use in our place in our institute is the vmac and the cmac the, the cmac which is a non challenge uh, channel uh, laryngoscope so there is lot of space available to pass the tube so even in patients with restricted mouth opening so like one finger breadth or one and a half finger breadth in even in these patients a successful intubation is quite possible with a video laryngoscope but with these like such as the c track or the air track this is not, not really helpful when uh, planning a Uh, uh in video laryngoscopy guided intubation in a patient with restricted mouth opening so be aware of the kind of equipment you have and we have often faced this situation where this was not possible at all uh, to introduce a uh, we had a few demonstration pieces and it was not possible to do with a channel the laryngoscope so be aware of this okay uh, now uh, another thing is we have to have the plan of rescue oxygenation in uh, when attempting a difficult airway in such patients so one is when going for conventional in induction then pre oxygenate very well uh, that is up to 3 to 4 minutes prior to uh, induction and also when attempting an awake fiber optic intubation usually we uh, use nasal prongs to oxygenate the patient so that they are adequately uh, pre oxygenated and when the uh, patients have multiple comorbidities and they have, you fear there is a risk of apnea or hypoxia yeah we often use uh, high frequency nasal cannula to increase the oxygen reserve and when bag and mask ventilation is possible please use that when a difficult lar uh, laryngoscopy or intubation is uh, encountered switch over to bag and mask to uh, increase the oxygen re reserves supraglottic airway has very limited role in these patients because usually the mouth opening is not adequate or there is a big lesion in the oral cavity placing an sga will further cause bleeding so this is usually a very limited option in upper airway malignancy so it's not really a backup plan to have a supraglottic insertion supraglottic airway insertion as far as surgical airway is concerned there are two options available a cricothyrotomy and tracheostomy i will discuss about cricothyrotomy uh, for the down this uh, so coming on the for the decisions for awake intubation if any if you feel that the airway usually this is what i do when the airway is uh, i feel there is a gray zone and i i the mouth opening is doubtful then it's better to go straight away with an awake intubation there is no point in risking in inducing the patient and then finally deciding that uh, you know it's not uh, possible then doing an uh, intubation fiber optic intubation intubation under ga becomes very stressful so there are further uh, some factors which will guide whether this will be feasible or not so some factors which definitely go in the favor of awake fob include prior surgery like where where there are, you have already there are some patients who have undergone free flaps or uh, or a local flap but come with recurrence so these patients straight away they go for fiber optic intubations and patients with severe trismus where there is no mouth opening definitely go for fob or there is a periglottic growth or even when there is adequate mouth opening but there is a 
very obvious mass a valicular mass which is present or a bulky tongue these conditions also mandate a fob guided intubation and also there is history of prior uh, rt or uh, the surgical access to the airway is very difficult in those situations better to go with awake fob but there are some contraindications to a fob as well where there is an agitated patient coming in severe stridor in these situations it's not really safe to attempt a fob guided intubation because when patients have severe stridor all already the glottic chink will be obstructed in those situations putting a fob uh, will further narrow the uh, glottic opening and cause a cork in bottle effect there are some patients who uh, when when it is attempted patients might go into bradycardia or an arrest also so better to avoid uh, fob and go for a surgical airway in those conditions uh, and also it doesn't have much role in subglottic tumors also better to avoid it. In, in agitated patients, topicalization with LA also can trigger a laryngospasm. So, uh, always have surgical backup in such conditions. So, this image I wanted to show that where um, uh, a preoperative endoscopy has shown this big mass, uh, vocal cord lesion. So, that in the CT also there is a significant narrowing in the scene in the uh, uh, vocal cord. So, this will not usually be amenable for an FOB. So, better to go for a lower, uh, into, uh, lower airway access. So how do we, I won't be discussing exactly about how, how to use the FOB, but how do we prepare for an FOB, which can be explained because uh, it, that requires hands-on practice to how to do a fiber optic intubation. But uh, how do we prepare patients for an FOB is that we usually counsel the patients a day before as to what they have to expect. And often patients are aware because they've already undergone an endoscopy, they're usually aware as to what is to be done and uh, get their consent. And on the day of uh, the procedure, we uh, give a dose of glycopyrrolate if they can tolerate the tachycardia. And the cardiac compromised patients, we avoid the step, giving injection glycopyrrolate in the recovery room and also start a low dose of dexmedetomidine for sedation, procedural sedation. That is one microgram per kg over 10 minutes. And uh, based on the patient's body weight, calculate the lignocaine dose. So for topicalization, eight to nine milligram per kg of lignocaine can be safely given. But working within these limits, we topicalize the airway with uh, nebulization with 4% lignocaine, spraying the oral cavity with 10% of lignocaine. So each puff with a 10% lignocaine is around 10 mg. So safely 7 to 8 puffs can be given in the oral cavity and also uh, lubricating the nasal cavity with lignocaine jelly and using a nasal decongestant really helps. So once that is anesthetized, a nasopharyngeal airway of appropriate size is placed to further dilute Ways to ease the passage of the airway. Okay, so going further, always also important uh, for the transtrichal blocks that we give. Uh, this is a, uh, shows the landmarks that we should note. Usually, it is not always possible because they're post radiation or have undergone some surgery, they'll be scarring. Uh, so, uh, look at the thyroid cartilage as far as possible and look at the uh, that is the thyroid cartilage is here and the cricoid and the space in between. You can also use ultrasound to visualize the cricothyroid membrane and instill the local anesthetic there. Uh, we often use a, um, a 2 ml syringe, a hypodermic needle, and once the airway uh, uh, air bubbles come into the uh, syringe, then the drug is given. So the risk is that you can injure the post uh, posterior wall of the trachea, so you can also use a venflon to administer the blocks. Usually we avoid other blocks because of the risk of, uh, you know, uh, if there is a malignancy in the uh, upper airway, uh, giving a block near the hyoid can sometimes cause an injury. So we usually avoid that because of the vascular structures of, uh, uh, in the uh, closer area. So we avoid that. So the transtrichal blocks are safe to perform. So sedation, as I said, minimal sedation is what, is, uh, is what we use as safe uh, because it's safe and spontaneous ventilation is maintained. And usually for procedural sedation, propofol is better avoided because it carries the risk of acne and hypoventilation and hypoxia. And very, very important, check all the equipment, airway equipment, suction, and also make sure the surgeon is already there in the OT before you start the endoscopy. So it's very important to have certain things in place to ensure a successful intubation uh, with a well oxygenated, well sedated patient with adequate topical anesthesia because all these factors will affect the intubation process. So uh, there, are some, there are some problems which can happen during a fiber optic intub intubation which can be complicated. There can be bleeding and uh, uh, this inadequate anesthesia causing an agitated patient. And uh, the endo you might have difficulty in passing the tube through the nasal cavity itself because of the size uh, variation. And sometimes when the tube is bigger than the fiber optic uh, scope, 
it can get hinged on the glottic structures and not pass inside where patient starts coughing also so that becomes difficult so choose the size of the tube adequately and when there is a subglottic uh, there is a subglottic edema or there is a laryngeal mass itself so that that makes brings us to the point again that we have to choose the patients correctly so these are the uh, managing procedural complications as i said earlier we have to oxygenate well sedate optimally and topicalize optimally and also limit attempts and call for experienced help whenever required that is avoid task fixation that i should do it that no that's not the scenario always take help when in trouble so coming now to the anesthetic management in general for intraoperative monitoring usually standard monitoring is uh, uh, go ahead with the standard monitoring as per ace standards invasive monitoring we choose only based on the comorbidities and if there is a need for hypotensive anesthesia we use invasive dp monitoring airway as i discussed earlier we will uh, we plan the airway and go ahead with that and uh, the choice of endotracheal tube is very important so for example if it's going to be a nasotracheal tube uh, planning for uh, delayed extubation you can use uh, a normal pvc tube or a reinforced tube based on the resources available and uh, if it is going to be a, a surgery involving a lot of movement then go for a reinforced uh, flexometallic tube itself and uh, if it's going to be uh, we are going to replace the tracheostomy tube then go for a reinforced tube and for laser surgeries uh, we go for a laser resistant tube that is the flex laser flex tube and uh, that micro laryngeal surgery also we use the mls tube which has a smaller diameter such as 5 mm and is longer in length and has a a uh, normal cuff that is as much as a uh, 8 mm uh, tube the cuff has that much volume so it can be that is used for microlaryngeal surgeries also very important a throat pack is often used by surgeons and is usually placed by the surgeons themselves so always confirm whether they have placed one or, and before uh, before the completion of, uh, once the procedure is completed ensure it is removed so this these are the different types of tubes we use we uh, positioning usually reverse tendenberg is preferred in these patients because to provide uh, a bloodless field so make sure you maintain the hemodynamics accordingly to, so that there is no cerebral hypoperfusion and uh, chest pads are placed and avoid excessive neck neck extension because surgeons prefer hyper extension so that the neck exposure is good for nodal dissection and pressure point padding eye protection must be done these patients often tend to have uh, their um, cleaning liquids usually trickle into the eyes so tape the eyes securely and probably uh, we usually cover them with gauze till the cleaning and draping is done so that the eyes are protected and hands are tucked close to the torso Uh, induction we decided as earlier whether i should be awake or asleep and once the airway is in place you can go ahead with the routine induction agents and drugs that we use based on the patient's comorbidities and hemodynamics opioids we use short acting as well as long acting we prefer long acting opioids when the airway is going to be retained so that tube tolerance is better in the post operative period so that we don't need to keep switching between different opioids and uh, maintenance inhalation or tiva can be used tiva is usually preferred uh, in cases where there is uh, uh, anticipated interrupt, uh, interruption in the ventilation such as in laryngeal surgeries where we keep removing the endotracheal tube for the creation of the laryngostoma tiva is preferred in these situations because uh, to avoid ot pollution some surgeons complain of uh, exposure to volatiles so in those situations tiva is preferred and also in head and neck surgery it might be a prudent choice because a head and neck surgery itself is a risk factor for pnb so can be used it also provides a safe way of hypotensive anesthesia also and uh, coming to blood loss in these surgeries uh, some some of them might go on I mean, like it might not even be mentionable but some surge, uh, some resections can cause significant blood loss and has to be planned prior and usually iv access uh, because the hands are going to be tucked place extra iv lines before itself and uh, in surgeries that will require a free flap uh, discuss with the surgeon as to which limbs can be used for iv cannulation or for even arterial line placements make sure of these uh, points of discussion before itself so that we avoid any accidental pricks and um, blood loss might be uh, uh, in especially in free flap surgeries the resection of the malignant lesion itself might cause significant blood loss and usually uh, reconstructive surgeons are wary of uh, blood replacement in free flaps so make sure you replace whatever blood is lost beforehand itself based on the minimum uh, maximum allowable blood loss uh, and coming to the miscellaneous points they uh, we usually use pneumatic uh, compression devices and use post air warming usually hypothermia is not an issue in these patients but if for prolonged surgeries use a under body warmer preferably because it, especially in free flap surgeries they expose the head and neck region as well as the thigh to harvest the graft therefore warming with a uh, just an over blanket might be difficult to achieve so an under body warmer is ideal for such patients uh, 
uh, we always place an nasogastric tube because these patients will be initiated on early enteral feeds as part of eras so therefore placing uh, the ngt might be difficult so take help with the medical gastroenterologist if there is too much scarring of the airway bladder catheterization depends on the du surgical duration and sometimes when the patient is planned for an early extubation the next day then uh, steroids have a role to reduce the airway edema and iv antibiotics based on the surgical requirement and usually we repeat the antibiotics at every 4 hours of the procedure coming to practical issues during surgery there can be accidental tube disconnections migration the tube might get kinked there might be raised airway pressures and tube damage can happen which can lead to a sudden loss of airway and there there is often accidental extubation also so we have to have a reintubation strategy in place and everything happens under the drapes so you have to be very aware and hyper vigilant because you are sharing the airway and many a times airway soiling happens because we place a nasotracheal tube there might be some bleeding which happens and goes into the tube so always suction out the tube before handing over to the surgeon so that our uh, end of the uh, patient is completely problematic problem free so a, a few words on considerations for specific surgeries so that because each surgical uh, plan changes so for nasal maxilla and pnl surgeries usually an oral ett is preferred and for intra oral surgeries they go with a nasal ett with throat packing throat packing usually is done by the surgeons themselves for most surgeries and when it comes to craniofacial dissections usually it can extend up to the skull base so plan iv access accordingly uh, now neuro monitoring might be required might need tiva because of neuro monitoring and there is also a risk of uh, venous air embolisms because of the uh, cranial uh, uh, vault being handled and uh, blood loss is very likely so be prepared for that coming to free flaps which are being uh, taken more or uh, in number these days because of the cosmetic benefits to the patient it's a very prolonged surgery to note and in these situations goal directed fluid therapy is very beneficial so placing an invasive access makes sense because we uh, uh, surgeons prefer a hyperdynamic circulation in these patients but excessive fluid overload is not really beneficial and it has been shown that uh, using vasoconstrictors to maintain perfusion might not impair the flap uh, survival also so having uh, a goal directed uh, fluid therapy plan might help in maintaining good hemodynamics along with vasopressors uh, ensure adequate urine output in these patients especially because you will be giving significant fluids and ideal to maintain the hematocrit around uh, 30 to 35% so this involves as i said earlier uh, uh, fixed tra uh, transfusion trigger so you can replace the blood loss before the reconstructive phase starts and discuss with the surgeon also what is the likely transfusion trigger they are comfortable with and also in uh, intraoperatively they might convert the airway to a tracheostomy once the major part of the surgery is done so be prepared for that or you and sometimes they fast track the patients and plan for delayed extubation so usually free flap patients do well with delayed extubations with an endotracheal tube the next day because the flap is not that bulky but you have to be aware that these patients also the flap survival is also an issue so always check the flap survival uh, flap uh, blood glucose at the end of the surgery to make sure that one, when the patient is leaving from the ot the flap survival is okay because sometimes we push the patient out and they come back for uh, uh, re exploration within a few hours because the flap is not viable anymore so that has to always be checked before planning extubation the next day also so how do we man monitor these flaps bedside techniques such as uh, capillary refill checking for a pin prick and looking for the blood uh, oozing out checking the flap cbg and comparing with the cbg from any other normal extremity and also uh, by doppler uh, which the surgical team usually practices Uh, salivary gland tumors usually re may require nerve monitoring they may ask you to withhold muscle relaxants so safely intubation can be practiced with muscle relaxants and then go ahead with the surgery uh, transoral robotic surgery this this includes some of the recent advances in head and neck surgery so in this we usually place a nasal reinforced endotracheal tube and use a longer ventilation circuits because it's impossible to have uh, any uh, contact with the airway once the surgeon docks the robot and uh, you have to ensure that there is Uh, deep muscle relaxation because you don't want the patient bucking when they are doing something and uh, in the oral cavity with all these robotic arms so better to give deep muscle relaxation and use tough monitoring while coming to the time of uh, recovery uh, it's usually not a, uh, much of a problem because we retain the tube in these patients because there's a lot of oral edema that is present and um, throat packing is done so ensure it is removed when before the patient leaves the op laryngeal surgeries usually these patients come with a tracheostomy already 
or you may have to be the one placing the awake fob and uh, we change over to a uh, reinforced tube once the patient is uh, under anesthesia and we use the tiva as far as possible along with this monitoring to maintain the depth of anesthesia intermittent uh, apnea is required and one important point to notice they keep taking out the tube and placing it back in so sometimes uh, the tube uh, placement is further uh, deeper than what is uh, required so you might note uh, raised airway pressures so keep uh, telling the surgeon and giving them feedback about this as well and for transoral laser uh, surgery this you might all be familiar with but in we usually use laser as a resistant tube which has got two cuffs so it is filled with the methylene and uh, blue tinged uh, saline so that we uh, get to know when the cuff is damaged and uh, so that we know that the distal cuff is still intact and uh, can, corrective action can be taken IV steroids can be used, and the precautions meant for laser has to be taken. That is, use lower lower FiO2 when the surgeon is operating, and always be aware that a laser fire, induced fire can happen. And uh, coming to external carotid artery ligation, this is usually a procedure taken as an emergency when there is bleeding. This might be uh, when a patient has undergone surgery and uh, develops post-surgical bleeding. So they might come with a definite. They might come to the OT with an airway in place, such as an endotracheal tube or a tracheostomy. Uh, so be prepared with blood products if needed. And also, uh, while they're ligating the ECA, there might be uh, uh, the carotid artery, uh, carotid body stimulation. So be prepared for bradycardia episodes or vagal episodes. So uh, use an anticholinergic agent for uh, during the surgery. And many a times, uh, evaluation of these patients also requires anesthesia. So examination under anesthesia might be required. So in this situation, all the same techniques that I discussed, that is have an airway plan in place and usually a delayed extubation is preferred because they take multiple biopsies and uh, that leads to increased airway edema. So even though it might be just a biopsy under anesthesia, a delayed extubation is what is preferred. Now, coming to extubation, how do we decide on that? What, do you, what all can you keep in mind? The tumor location, very important. And how long did the surgery go on? How did it go on? Any issues during surgery? What was the blood loss like? What is the patient's condition like? And what are the types of flaps used? A local flap is often uh, bulky. So that causes more of airway edema compared to a free flap. And also you have to note what are the pre-existing conditions the patient has, such as COPD. The, will the patient tolerate uh, spontaneous ventilation after such a prolonged surgery? That, has also to, that should also be kept in mind. And the intraoperative course, as I mentioned, and we, uh, depending on the facilities available, is somebody there around the clock to monitor the airway? Or if you, in case you extubate the patient on table, is there somebody to secure the airway? Is that person skilled enough to place an airway in a compromised patient? That also has to be kept in mind. And the surgical backup. You have surgical oncologists available who can place in a surgical array in an emergency. That also has to be kept in mind. And also always know that they leave a lot of intraoral bolsters inside to control bleeding. So that has to be kept in mind when you are planning an extubation. Make sure you have the surgeon by, uh, on standby with you. Remove the bolster, do a neural examination as far as possible, and then extubate when it's a delayed extubation. So extubation strategies include extubation on table, can be done usually for nasal surgeries uh, because uh, it does not usually complicate issues. A nasal pack is placed, remove the oral pack and extubate. Ensure absolute hemostasis and the patient should be awake and aware. Delayed extubation, when, as I said earlier, where oral surgeries, significant edema is anticipated, extubate on the next day with a retained nasotracheal tube and make sure that the oral packs are removed. And when there is a tracheostomy, retain and wean as routinely as you would do. Where there is need for post-operative ventilation, uh, based on usual clinical practices, that can be continued. And where you have a retained ETT and tracheostomy, patients usually find it difficult to tolerate. So you can nebulize it with 4% lignocaine to ensure tube tolerance. And here is where low, uh, longer acting opioids are very useful to maintain the uh, tube tolerance. And cuff pressure should be checked. And when the patient is aware enough, awake enough in a tracheostomy tube, the cuff should be deflated so that tracheal necrosis doesn't happen. So post-operative care, routine post-operative care is ensured, ensure adequate hydration, implement the ERAS, we implement the ERAS protocols that is, uh, uh, in, as per our institution, we implement those, ensure uh, early enteral feeding because usually it's not a contraindication in these patients and we supplement with anti-emetics and uh, uh, analgesics such as paracetamol, diclofenac, if not contraindicated, can be added and uh, with the opioids, we supplement the analgesia and IV steroids if, based on discussions with the surgeons and DVT prophylaxis is ensured. So the complications that we should be aware of, early complications are commonly bleeding. So when you have a tracheostomy tube, please inflate the cuff uh, as early as possible to prevent airway soiling and hypoxia. 
and uh, usually there can be edema when you extubate and there is respiratory distress and often in flap patients flap failure is a common complication so they might come in untimely hours so be aware of that also uh, delayed complications are usually infection and flap bleeding and sometimes flap uh, necrosis there some scenarios here that i would like to uh, just uh, show here uh, this is a patient we saw with a salivary gland tumor so in this case as you see there is a big mass over here and which can complement uh, complicate mask ventilation this is, this is just to show where all we can encounter some difficulties so this patient uh, had a restricted mouth opening with uh, odd looking uh, dentition as well so in this situation think of uh, that laryngoscopy with a conventional technique might be difficult so think of video laryngoscopy if possible or fob guided intubation this is the patient with a bulky tongue so he is uh, um, has a uh, the malampati classification is also not very favorable so in this patient we chose video laryngoscopy to intubate and uh, this patient has a hard palate mass which is friable and likely to bleed so better to stay away from it as far as possible so video laryngoscope might help or going with an fop and this is a patient with a very bulky ulcero proliferative growth in the tongue very likely to bleed and laryngoscopy might not be possible also so definitely go with awake fop this patient has a restricted mouth opening but it can be it can be possible to intubate with laryngoscopy in the direct laryngoscopy but also have a vls backup and this patient uh, there has an oropharyngeal growth as you can see here there is an oropharyngeal growth over here so better to would be to attempt a fibrotic intubation because passing the tube might be difficult or even doing laryngoscopy might be difficult so i have a few scenarios that, that we faced uh, in our practice so i would just like to tell you how i did it in these scenarios so the first patient was a 52 year old male who presented with an incidental neck node and uh, actually he had gone for a nosidoscopy for evaluation of gastritis and that's when they noted a uh, a valicular mass so after that he was planned for a robotic neck uh, robotic uh, transoral robotic surgery and neck dissection he had no comorbidities so we uh, saw the ogd imaging which showed a significant valicular mass but still uh, the uh, anesthesiologist planned to do a, a video laryngos check video laryngoscopy under sedation so video laryngoscopy showed that the, um, uh, uh, that kind of an intubation would not have been possible so an awake intubation only would be uh, a, a fiber optic intubation would be the most uh, safe way to go about it but once we attempted the fiber optic intubation there was significant bleeding because of the video laryngoscopy itself so that uh, then we attempted through the uh, other nostril with uh, again further usage of uh, nasal uh, vasoconstrictors and suctioning and that, that's when it became we suctioned the oral cavity the nasal cavity and then uh, endoscopy through the opposite uh, nostril could uh, we could intubate the patient successfully that's how the surgery went off uneventfully and we uh, extubated in the next day so uh, this second patient that i wanted to talk about was she is a 45 year old patient who had history of hypopharyngeal carcinoma she had already undergo undergone radiation and she uh, came few years ago and she came with a history of strider and was likely a case of recurrence and uh, she had a relapse and she needed an urgent rectostomy because of the strider so the surgeon wanted uh, us to place the uh, place the endotracheal tube so that he could do the rectostomy as the surgical landmarks were completely obscured because of radiation so what did we do a uh, quick psa showed that she was uh, not uh, npo and uh, the airway was also difficult the surgical landmarks were completely not there so we used ultrasound to localize the cricothyroid membrane as you can see this is the thyroid cartilage this is the cricoid cartilage and these are the tracheal rings and the depression in between is the cricothyroid membrane so we visualized these and topicalized the airway explained to her and uh, successfully did an endo uh, fob guided intubation and under local anesthesia and after which ga was induced and tracheostomy was done so uh, there was this patient who uh, underwent a uh, uneventful nasal intubation for a composite resection of the oral uh, lesion with a myocutaneous flap and uh, the, uh, that is a local flap sorry an infrared flap and the plan was to retain the etp for delayed extubation the next day morning during the surgery i noticed that there were some air bubbles coming out there was a hissing sound and there was no delivery from the uh, the ventilator bellows had collapsed 
So further inspection showed that the circuit was intact, and then we found that the pilot balloon was completely deflated. The surgeon had actually nicked the uh, pilot balloon, and the tube had got uh, deflated. And so, how do we change the tube in the middle of the surgery? The surgery was just ongoing, and in the middle of the surgery, it is difficult to change. So we asked them to pack the oral cavity with uh, uh, adequate throat packs. It did not impair the surgical view. And uh, tidal volumes uh, were adequate, and we suctioned out the airway, and the uh, so there was no further soiling of the airway. And at the end of the surgery, further deepening of the plane was done. We placed a bougie, and the video laryngos with video laryngoscopic guidance, we uh, visual under vision, we changed the ET tube and extubated the next. Uh, this was actually a very uh, difficult situation we faced. Uh, we had received a code blue call for a patient from the CT suite who had undergone a lung biopsy. on reaching there only i found out that the patient was an oral cavity malignancy who had undergone radiation and direct laryngoscopy or fob was completely impossible in that emergency situation uh, the surgical oncologist was also available so the first uh, plan was to go ahead with the uh, surgical cricotherotomy all the equipments were available and we went ahead with that so we achieved ros uh, with a placement of a uh, endotracheal tube through the cricothyroid membrane patient did not make it but we did achieve ros for a Few minutes after ensuring, uh, probably due to a lung bleed inside, but we did achieve ventilation. So how do we do this? Uh, we usually have a set uh, of uh, a self-compiled cricotherotomy uh, set which is available, which you can also practice. This includes a twenty-size uh, scalpel, bla uh, scalpel blade, and a bougie, and a five, five or six-size endotracheal tube, along with suction that is the anchor suction to aid in uh, uh, clearing out the uh, blood or debris. And uh, uh, usually mark the uh, feel the anatomical landmarks and make a horizontal incision on the cricotherotomy membrane. a uh, horizontal incision and bluntly dissect and once you reach the cricothyroid membrane extend the horizontal incision and then introduce the blade in a vertical fashion with the blade uh, directed towards the vocal cords uh, sorry away from the vocal cords that is uh, caudally and then pass the bougie and endotracheal tube over it this should not be done when there is any laryngeal trauma and also in children lesser than 10 years of age because of subglottic narrowing so don't attempt it in that and uh, it is very important to know surgical cricotherotomy because it's a very simple procedure but when it happens in an emergency situation our uh, mental faculties become clouded because of panic so better to know this technique and it's easy so that will increase our uh, confidence in doing it lastly i would like to discuss about this one patient we had retained in the icu for free flap monitoring and uh, subsequently he developed a surgical site infection and uh, suddenly he had a uh, um, torrential bleed there was an oral cavity bleed because of some sort of erosion which had happened uh, internally and we could not make out the site of bleeding outside and he had aspirated a lot of blood so the first uh, and he coded because of that so the first step to do here was to inflate the tracheostomy tube and achieve airway control and patient uh, achieved rosc after that so always remember when there is a tracheostomy tube in situ and patient has arrested please inflate it to ensure that you achieve ventilation because sometimes in these situations it's a hypoxic arrest so our take away from this uh, talk is uh, one second yeah a detailed psc is very 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 important and review of the airway imaging is very essential and always be a, a, the safest and simplest options should be kept in mind the sim simplest might not necessarily be the easiest but the uh, but will be the safest one always discuss with the surgical colleagues uh, what they need and what can what can be done for the patient keep multiple airway plans in place because and also inform an experienced uh, colleague and request their standby very important to know your limitations and avoid task fixation that this has to be done in a particular way please don't have the limitation always remember cancer is a very dynamic disease and presentations can change by the time of surgery and uh, at all times beware that you share an airway with the surgeon be hyper vigilant and there is no hurry to extubate these patients take your time and lastly a safe and wise anesthesiologist is always better than a daring one any day always ask for help these are my references thank you for listening so patiently to me you didn't give us a choice did you it was a beautiful presentation dr pita excellent you, presentation i think every everybody listening would have would really really agree with me uh, if we go to the chat box we have a couple of questions uh, from dr sendil murugan i just read it through yes. is dexmedidomidin safe in an already cachectic patient uh ma'am so in that situation we use lower uh, doses Uh, say for uh, if not one microgram per kg, reduce the dose to 0.5 microgram per kg and give it very slowly under observation. 
but it started uh, way before the plan for intubation like 30 minutes before we received these patients earlier there might be some delay in starting the case but we received them earlier and sedate them a bit earlier because patient cooperation is a must when planning an awake intubation so we titrate the doses based on that the recommendation is one mic but we can go to lower doses to lower the tolerance and his second question from dr sendil murugan is what are the practical problems of central lines with head and neck dissection uh usually in center uh, head and neck dissection central line placement is usually not required because uh, one thing is that in these uh, extensive surgeries post surgical they anyway uh, the main concern here is going to be initiating feeding unlike in gat cases where feeding might not be possible immediately head and neck patients we do in in initiate enteral feeding so that can be achieved through the nasogastric tube so usually this is central line access is not re really required in these patients if peripheral access is difficult then yes so we place the lines and again we discuss with the surgeon on which side would be preferable and usually neck access we go for subclavian access because uh, neck is usually under dissection so we don't avoid that and if they will probably need a line for longer access they some patients come with a pick line so that can be used also post surgically so those considerations we keep in mind but we always discuss with the surgeon whether it will be possible or not there needs there seems to be a lot of interaction with the surgeons i hope they listen to us Uh, no, no, they do. <laughs> they do. Good. Good. The third question from Sandeep is not exactly a question. He says surgeons uh, do the tracheostomy postoperatively for some patients, which they decide pre-op itself. Being a shared airway, is it not good for the patient and for us in a difficult airway to go for pre-op tracheostomy rather than? post op tracheostomy uh, that's a valid point but having a tracheostomy before doing the surgical reconstruction becomes difficult to handle the tissues for them to create the flap mm -hmm. and do the dissection becomes difficult that's why uh, say for example in a composite resection and the pmmc flap they do the dissection completely they harvest the flap and just when they're going to do the insert they, they do the tracheostomy or once the insert is done then they do the tracheostomy because anyway the uh, everything is exposed so doing the tracheostomy is easier at that point of time So for surgical ease, we do that. Right, and uh, Dr. Manisha Madam's question was the same. If intubation is difficult and tracheostomy anyway planned, then pre-op, right? So you have answered her question also. And uh, Manisha Madam, in private setup, we prefer deferred extubation, which may be after four hours to twenty-four hours. So how do you do it, Madam? Ma'am, uh, we usually uh, in head and neck management is in our. institute we have this protocol that we extubate delayed only we extubate the next day morning unless uh, it's very very minimal surgery involving the oral cavity still we is for example if it's an examination under anesthesia even then we retain the patient in the post anesthesia care unit and till our list gets over we retain them there and we extubate them ourselves once after ensuring a complete hemostasis patient is fully aware and awake then we extubate them in the under our supervision and we then we send the ward patients but usually the protocol is to extubate the next day morning only the next day morning this okay, madam and i think we have uh, one more question from madam manisha uh, madam did you say flap sugar levels flap yes ma'am yes so uh, flap monitoring ma'am because uh, then it starts becoming congested the flap sugar values actually come down so usually what they do is they uh, check prick the flap to see the blood oozing out and they check the capillary blood glucose in that and at the same time they check the flap sugar in some other normal periphery also so they compare if it is comparable then the flap is usually viable and they monitor it and also that they, they check the color of the uh, flap to know the viability so sometimes when it is not it's ambiguous this the flap sugar monitoring also helps in knowing the the uh, condition of the flap sometimes uh, patients have just been shifted out and when they check the flap sugar values they are quite low and we have there are instances where we have taken them back again for surgery for re exploration of the flap so it's very important to check before we shift out the patient post the flap surgery okay that's something very new to us uh, i think heetal sir has a question heetal sir yeah yes ma'am uh, can i uh, comment something uh, with permission of putham ma'am and your permission 
Sir, sir, please. Yeah. Please. yeah. So it was an excellent, excellent presentation. Everything was covered. Thank you, sir. Uh, but I would like to add uh, something about blind nasal intubation. Uh, blind nasal intubation is nowadays like a forgotten art uh, because of availability of resources in most centers. But uh, we are still doing it. Actually, we stopped doing it. Uh, but at the time of uh, Corona, we again started doing it. Uh, conventionally, it is done under local anesthesia. But uh, we do it after giving protocol and schooling. But in say, uh, uh, we select the patient properly because uh, we don't do in the post-surgical patient, those who are coming for redo surgery, or we don't do it in radiated patient. But in other patient, I've seen that uh, even with uh, zero mouth opening, uh, we are doing it since last 20 years. And uh, many of my colleagues in Rajkots are also doing it. And uh, we have done almost 5,000 cases. Unfortunately, we have published it. Uh, but I would like to show the video of blind intubation. Uh, we usually give pro uh, propofol check to ventilation and uh, then after checking the ventilation we give scolin advantage is when we give scolin uh, 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 usually what happens is uh, uh, airway get uh, relaxed and it is easier to insert the endotracheal tube. Uh, this is the video of uh, blind nasal intubation and you can see it is just 0. 40, 44 second video. Uh, after giving propofol, I am uh, extending the jaw. I am manipulating, manipulating the larynx with uh, my middle finger. You can see it. I have elevated the jaw with my index finger. You can see it. Uh, and I am feeling uh, the uh, 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 vocal pores and once I am in, I am checking it with uh, ATCO2 also and within 20 seconds or so, you can intubate the patient very easily and once you learn the, the art, it is just like putting an epidural catheter or uh, putting a spinal. Uh, you start uh, getting feel of the uh, uh, vocal pod and the trachea. So this art should be revived and I, I, I say this, this is important especially for freelancers who don't have access to the uh, FOB and even in institute, uh, uh, one year back only we had a patient we had a, uh, who had an intraoral bleeding patient was uh, uh, gasping and the patient had huge neck knots. So surgeon was not able to do doing a tracheostomy. So he was about to giving giving it up and fiber optic was also not possible because there was bleeding inside the oral cavity. So we simply did the blind uh, uh, awake intubation and uh, fortunately we could intubate the patient and survive the patient. So I believe that uh, this art should be revived and uh, everybody should attempt at least in the good mouth opening patients uh, uh, where they are putting nasal tubes. Uh, so once you start doing it, uh, it is really very easy. Ethan, sir, Thank can you. we just go through it a little? Uh, like I think you were a bit fast there. You said proper fall and you were saying something about scoring. Yeah. Did you give both or yeah. just so after? Yeah, no, we give propofol, check the ventilation okay. after giving propofol, then we give scolin. Once scolin is given, we intubate the patient. Okay. And this video is available on YouTube also. And That's uh, a we fabulous have done, video. Uh, yeah, so we have done almost 2,000 cases with the same technique. And uh, now my fellows and uh, juniors are also doing it regularly. So we keep doing it so that uh, we don't forget that art. Preetha, madam, you, do you have experiences in blindness? Ma'am, actually, uh, here I don't have much experience. Not uh, It's not been encouraged also because of the risk yeah. of bleeding. So we yeah. don't uh, go ahead with it because uh, it can uh, complicate things further when we do it without vision. The sir is experienced in it, but here we are... Uh, very skeptical yeah, it, about it, doing it, that's why. Yeah, it, it looks scary, obviously. But uh, mm -hmm. I'll say with experience uh, that uh, Definitely, uh, uh, in the last 20 years or so, there is hardly any uh, failure of intubation and we had to go for tracheostomy. I think one or two cases among 10 of us. Uh, so it is very safe once you start uh, doing it. And uh, we use, uh, especially this Portex blue color tube, it is very soft and when you lubricate the nasal cavity properly, I haven't seen any bleeding in most of the cases. Thank you so much for sharing. And I think uh, Manisha Madam agrees with you. Uh, blind nasal intubation, uh, she, she agrees with you. And she also goes with retrograde uh, as they don't have FOB. Yeah, so, yeah, that is also a good technique. Do, yes. So thank you so much, both of you, Heetal Sir, as well as Preeta Madam.
beautiful topics, well discussed. The entire spectrum, I think you have covered the entire spectrum. It was an absolute pleasure listening and seeing all your slides. Thank you so much. And special thank mention you. to Geetha, sir. Thank you for sharing your YouTube link. It's going to help us uh, in so many ways. Rajesh, sir, anything else you want to add, sir? Good, good, uh, uh, as you said, it's an uh, excellent uh, academic piece from both the speakers and we enjoyed it. And uh, from the team of online anesthesia, anesthesia update team, we would like to thank uh, our coordinator, Dr. Gomati, Madam, and speakers, Dr. Hethal Batera and Dr. Preeta Raj. And once again, uh, thanks to Akrula, A1 Logistics, and the Anesthesia TV, which is our media partner, for uh, conducting this session successfully. Thank you. Thank you, one and all, and thank you so much. We'll conclude this session with this. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.